everyone. Well, last time we began a two-part mini-series in the book of 1 John on the topic of true love. And I took that title from verse 18 of chapter 3 of John, where John says, Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. It's talking about true, loving truly, having true love. And in God's sight, there's a love which is a pretense, and there's a love which is true. And a Christian must love truly. We must love people with the kind of love the Lord sees as being as representative of him and his kingdom. He begins that verse, John does, by saying, let us not love in word or in talk. So what does that mean? Well, it's the idea that because we tell somebody that we've loved them, that we actually do. Like our words are an ultimate expression of our love. And John says, actually, no, that's not the case. Talk is cheap. Don't think you love somebody because of the words you've spoken to them. Uh, sometimes we think that by telling people we love them over and over and over again, that somehow that means our love has become manifest. The more we tell them the lo we love them, the more we actually love them. Uh, sometimes I hear Christians saying they've expressed love towards people by telling them hard truths. I spoke to them like that because I love them. But John says that love isn't complete through words. Now, don't get me wrong, words do matter. The Bible says that love is patient. It says that love is kind, that love is gentle. And those virtues can be expressed through words in the same way that hatred can be expressed through our words. Our words count, our words can bring life or death. But true love, John is saying, requires more than words. For our love to be true, John says it has to be outworked in deeds. It has to be outworked in our actions. And I believe that as someone who is seeking to be more like Jesus, you would want to know how to love truly. You would want to know how to love fully in the love of God. Uh, you'd want to know how to love people in the way that God has loved you. And that's what John's teaching us in this passage. It's what we're going to learn together today. He gives us three dimensions here of true love. See if you can spot them as we read through the passage together. Uh, so we're in 1 John uh, chapter 3 verse 16 to 18. 1 John 3 16 to 18 and it says this, uh, by this we know love that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay our lives down for the brothers. And again, that means brothers or sisters. Um, but if anyone has the world's good and sees his brother or sister in need, yet closes his heart against them, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. Let me tell you, what three things I see in this passage that is a requirement of true love. Uh, firstly, if you have a look at verse 16, true love requires sacrifice. John says that it's through Jesus laying down his life for us that we know true love. When God wanted the world to know that he is love and he wanted to show us his love, God didn't peer over the balcony of heaven and shout down to earth, I love you. It's not what he did. God didn't show his love for us by placing a message of love in the mouth of a prophet. What did he do? God himself became flesh. He suffered and died for us. And it's by that action, a very real, raw, material action, that he showed us love. It's only through that sacrifice that we can see love in its truest form. So we know that love requires sacrifice. Uh, this passage also tells us that love requires material generosity. Uh, verse 17 says that God's love doesn't abide in us if we close our hearts to those who are in need. Uh, it's certainly important that we say kind things to people. Let's not underestimate that. Uh, but for love to be true, we must also be willing to give what we have, to hand over our possessions to those who are in need. And of course, that links in 
with sacrifice. Uh, Jesus Christ handed over his whole life. He gave his body. Now God is not asking us to die for the world, but he is asking us to die to ourselves. He commands us to die to ourselves. Thirdly, in the second half of verse 17, we see that true love requires us to be inspired by the Holy Spirit and to walk in step with the Spirit. John says that if you close your heart towards a brother or sister who's in need, how does God's love abide in you? So we see there that true love comes from God's love abiding in us, from being in us. And Paul says in Romans uh, that God's love is poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. So if we're going to love truly, that is uh, that requires us to allow the love of God through the Holy Spirit to lead us. It's for the love of Christ to uh, fill us and to overflow from within us, out of us. So it's not just about sacrifice and it's not just about giving materially. It is about those things. But it's also about our practical actions being empowered by God within us. And that is what makes our love true. Uh, there are plenty of people in the world who give materially and they do so for selfish reasons. Not all charity is motivated by selflessness. But if our love is going to be true, ours, our charity has to be. And God sees the heart. God cares deeply about not just our actions, but also our motivations. So when you bring those three dimensions together and you bring them into focus, you begin to get a picture of the kind of love which comes from heaven. It's a love that God affirms as pleasing to him. And it's a love which he calls true, true love. So we should all be aiming to love like that. And if we did, uh, the world would know that we are Jesus' disciples. I don't think we would need to concern ourselves so much about getting the right campaigns and methods to reach people for Jesus. If we could love one another the way Jesus has called us to love. If we loved one another truly. It's really important that we realise that the world is always looking at the church. Even when we don't realise it. The world is looking to see whether the God that we profess to follow is really among us. Is he really in us? Is he empowering our actions? Um, I talked last week about hatred and anger and division and for how true love to exist those things can have no place among us many outsiders uh, look at the church and the reason they won't even listen to the message of the gospel is because they see these things present in the lives of those who proclaim to follow jesus and so before we even begin to share our message They've labelled us in their minds as hypocrites. And if, if those things are present, they are within their right to do so. Similarly, they're also looking to see how we care for one another in very real and practical ways. And if they look in and they see a church where some people have their fill of the world's possessions, and they see us standing alongside and worshipping alongside others who are in need and who are seeking to merely live, and they see this disparity, then they see a division. They see a divided body, and that becomes a stumbling block to them, and again, rightly so. And I have a concern that uh, we're so often busy trying to come up with the next campaign or method to reach the world for Jesus, that we miss the glaring issues in the body which will prevent people coming to him if they so much as spend a little bit of time with us. It's my conviction that if we loved one another the way the Bible teaches us to love, that our light would shine so brightly that people who are looking for Jesus would be drawn and they would find him among us. Now, of course, our witness to others is very important to the Lord. He spoke about that. Um, but our primary motivation in loving should actually be because we know it's pleasing to God. 
Uh, in fact, Jesus says in Matthew 25, that as we do unto our brothers and sisters, as we exercise practical love to them, so we do unto him. And that has to be at the forefront of our minds when we're seeking to love as he calls us to do. So let me just expand on what I believe this passage is saying to us about the kind of love that God is looking for in our lives as we give to other people. The first thing I want to say is that God is not looking at the amount that we give. Now, whether that be coins, whether it be notes, whether it be via a bank transaction or whether it be giving clothing or food or household items or provision for children or whatever it may be, he's not looking first and foremost at the raw amount that we give. What God is looking for when he's determining whether or not our love is true is what it has cost us personally to give. And that's because to love like God, we must sacrifice. Remember the story of the widow's might. People came and they were putting large sums in the offering box at the synagogue. She came and she put in two copper coins, which made a penny. And on the face of it, you might think that the people who put in more in terms of a raw amount, they loved more. But how did Jesus see it? How did God see it? Jesus says, truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing into the offering box, for they contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty has put in everything she had, all that she had to live on. Jesus' judgment was that although they put in more in terms of amount, the person who put in the most was actually that widow. Why? Because she put in all she had. Those two coins cost her more than it cost the others to put the thousands in. So her love was more complete, Jesus said. Her love was more like him who gave his all for us. Uh, what strikes me about the widow was that she viewed everything she had as belonging to God. Her money wasn't possessing her heart. Uh, sometimes we think it's only the rich who are possessed by money. But you know, poor people can be ruled by money too. However, that widow wasn't. She was ruled by the love of God. And I imagine that as she put those two copper coins into that box, at that very moment, she was thinking how, whilst she was foregoing some material provision on the earth, she was storing up her treasure in heaven. She wasn't holding on to her money with a tight fist saying, I'm poor, uh, I can't give to others who are in need, it's only, that's for the rich. Uh, she was saying, you know, I have Jesus, so what I have, I give. And Jesus affirmed her gift as being pleasing to him. To give like she did meant that she was going to have to go without. And that's what Jesus saw. And it's what Jesus sees in us. Do we put others before ourselves? to a point where we are willing to go without in order that they can live. And so in addition to sacrifice, God is looking for us to be generous, not to give a little bit, but to give abundantly. And when we think about abundant giving, sometimes we're thinking about giving lots, but abundant giving again is not about the amount, but it's about giving more than you're comfortable with giving. It's getting outside of your comfort zone. Good example of that in the Bible is the church in Macedonia who were commended by Paul. Uh, when Paul writes to the church at Corinth, he talks about the church in Macedonia as setting an example in material generosity that we should all follow. And that church in Macedonia, they'd heard about the plight of the Christians back in Jerusalem and they gave, even though they themselves were being afflicted they gave and they gave earnestly and they gave generously. This is what Paul said about them. Uh, as he writes to the church in Corinth, he says, we want you to know about the grace of God that's been given amongst the churches in Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. 
For they gave according to their means, and as I can testify, says Paul, they gave beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favour of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. Oh, there's a couple of things there that strike me about the way the love of God overflowed in their giving. Uh, firstly, and this is a, this is just incredible to me, they begged that they could take part in the relief of the saints. Uh, here's a people who are not sitting there being begged by their church leaders to give or their church leaders are not having to try and convince them into giving. They're not guilting them into giving. They're not having to twist their arm, not at all. Even though the believers in Macedonia were suffering themselves, they actually contact Paul and they beg Paul to allow them to give to the church in Jerusalem. Can you imagine a church where people contact their leaders begging to give to others who are in need? That's what the church was like in Macedonia. That's why Paul thought they were amazing. And more than that, in verse 3, Paul says they gave beyond their means. They didn't beg to give what they were able to give. They begged and they gave more than they were able to give. They're already suffer suffering. Uh, this church could have made a case that they should be the ones who are the recipients of a fundraiser. They could have looked at the church in Jerusalem and said to the other churches in Corinth and places like that, well, why don't you split it 50-50 between them and us so we can, we can have a fundraiser for us as well because, you know, we're suffering. They didn't do that. They weren't thinking about themselves. They contacted Paul. They said, we've heard about the church in Jerusalem. Paul, I know we've got nothing, but please let us take part in giving to them. Please let us help them be relieved. They were so occupied with love towards their fellow saints in Jerusalem. They just wanted to give their all for them to a point where it was very uncomfortable for the church in Macedonia. And isn't that a picture of Jesus? Isn't that his body representing him? It's a real life illustration of Paul's teaching in Philippians 2 about Jesus. And you'll probably know this scripture, but I'll remind you, this is what Paul said to the church at Philippi. He said, So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from my love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being of full accord in one mind. Paul says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, count others more significant than yourself. Let each of you look not to his own interests, but to the interests of others. Have this in mind amongst yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God something to be grasped. But he emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, Jesus humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. It's very easy to confess that we believe in Jesus, at least in our nation, uh, but it's harder to do what he did, to truly count others being more significant than ourselves, to have that mindset our natural man rushes to consider our own needs first. What am I missing out on? What do we need? Uh, what do we want? How unfair it is that we are not getting what we're after. And I know that because I find myself thinking like that far too much. Uh, we have to fight against that in the spirit. We have to put that to death by the spirit because it isn't the heart of Christ. Christ emptied himself for the good of others. He humbled himself for our good. He was a king, but he became a servant. He voluntarily laid himself down. He suffered, putting his own desires to one side. And in doing that, he showed us true love. Imagine a church, a body, where everybody thought like that. Sometimes in the church, 
were more concerned about memorizing scriptures and teaching scriptures than we are about actually living out the scriptures, living like the word of God. We have to remember that when we stand before Jesus, he ain't going to quiz us on what we know. He's going to quiz us on what we've done with what we know. And we see that following him in following him and in thinking like him and in living like him, we can only do it by the Holy Spirit. True love is nothing natural. It's supernatural. It's impossible to love truly without possessing the love of God because we are selfish creatures. We need the Holy Spirit to transform our hearts day by day to fill us and to lead us and to guide us into the love of Christ and by the love of Christ. And it's that last point that we see in John's passage here. The true love flows when the love of Christ is within us. And it's only there, the love of Christ is only there as we possess the Holy Spirit. We talk a lot in our part of the church about being filled with the Spirit. And often people will say the evidence, the concrete evidence of being filled with the Spirit is that you speak in tongues or that you prophesy because they've seen believers doing that in Acts after they were filled with the Spirit. Uh, what John says here is that the evidence of being filled with the Spirit, of abiding in Christ and having him abide in you, which is to be filled with the Spirit, is true love being manifest in your life. Love that sacrifices, love that gives materially, love that gives abundantly and generously. God is looking for us to give to others through the leading of the Spirit. The most obvious time in the New Testament where we see people uh, giving in that way, where they were they're filled with the Spirit and led by the Spirit, is of course the book of Acts. Uh, Pentecost happened, the Holy Spirit came, and Luke recorded events where people were taking what they owned, their possessions, they were selling them, and they were distributing to anybody who had need. In both Acts chapter 2 and in Acts chapter 4, it says the people didn't consider their possessions as belonging to them, but they had everything in common. That's a mindset. Their mindset was, uh, these things that I have, they're not mine. They're God's things. And, and he wants people who are in need to be cared for. And so I'll give them away. Um, there was a commonality. Uh, a preacher I've listened to quite a bit says, he has a little saying, uh, which I quite like, and that is that when the Holy Spirit is present in the church, uh, capitalism is impossible and communism isn't necessary. Okay, I'll say that again. When the Holy Spirit is present in the church, capitalism isn't possible, communism isn't necessary. We can't live every man for himself. We've all, I think we've already talked about that. It's not the way Jesus has called us to live survival of the fittest we're a body and when one part of the body rejoices we all rejoice when one part of the body hurts we all hurt uh, where where to nourish and cherish and care for the body where to care for one another uh, but neither is our commonality that we're called to have something that is enforced by law and that essentially is what communism is private ownership gets outlawed and I know Christians who I love dearly, who fundamentally believe that private ownership of goods and households is a sin. And their logic and their practice is flawed for various reasons. They, they, they look at Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 4, and they take from that that a Christian shouldn't own anything. But what we should do is uh, put everything we've got into one central pot and have a shared purse where the community owns everything centrally and the leadership of the community decide what happens with that. And I'll just point out a few issues with that way of thinking because it's not just present in certain denominations of the church, but it can creep into the thinking of Christians across the body. Uh, first of all, having no private ownership gives no room for the individual to be inspired by the Holy Spirit to give on an ongoing basis. Uh, part of what God is looking for in your life 
is that you're responsive to the Holy Spirit's leadership in your generosity. If you own nothing because one time you gave it all away, that then becomes impossible. You just become like a machine, like a robot. You hand over the decision making to somebody else. But for love to be present and to be seen, you need to be able to voluntarily make sacrifices on an ongoing basis. And to do that, you need to own things. Secondly, giving the whole, giving in the Holy Spirit is to give cheerfully. It's to see a need in somebody. It's to meditate on God's love towards you. And it's in the spirit to overcome your natural selfish tendencies. And it's to give out of a cheerful heart because you're basking in how Jesus has given himself for you. In 2 Corinthians 9, 6 to 7, Paul said, God doesn't want you to give out of compulsion because God loves a cheerful giver. He doesn't want you giving out of fear. He doesn't want you giving because you're under a law. He doesn't want you giving because it's part of your church tradition. He doesn't want your giving to be controlled by somebody else because then you're not giving out of true love. He wants gospel-centered, Holy Spirit-empowered, love-filled, cheerful givers. That's what represents Jesus best. Jesus was a man of sorrows. He was acquainted with grief, but the Bible says he had joy above all of his friends because he gave himself for the joy that was set before him. Jesus didn't enjoy the agony of the cross, but he was glad to give himself for us. And we need to reflect his gladness as we make sacrifices and give to others. We may not enjoy the going without bit, but actually we're overcome with joy as we contend to the needs of other people. And thirdly, and, and I think this is so important, giving in the Holy Spirit is to give in a real personal way, I believe. Um, that's not written propositionally in the scriptures. It's not written exactly, but it's a principle. I see in the life of Jesus and the apostles. They gave to individuals and churches that they knew. They gave to the people that they were praying for, people who knew them and who knew their love. Their giving was filled with compassion because they knew people as individuals. Now we can give to a charity and we can give to a cause and in a kind of impersonal way and not really know the charity or, or, the, or the recipients. And there's nothing wrong with that. We can still do that and do it joyfully. But I believe God wants us to be more invested in the people that we give to. In Jesus, we see a God who, although the whole world was lost, came, came and gave himself to a specific group of people who could receive his love. And from just those few people, the kingdom of God grew. There's so much need in the world. You know, Jesus even said, you'll always have the poor among you. There's always going to be loads of need. There are so many causes to give to. And I want to encourage you that in whoever you give to, or whatever you give to, that you would be invested. That you would give because your heart is moved by compassion towards those people. When people give because they're under a law, Actually, they're giving for their own benefit. It matters not who they're given to, because really their giving is about them achieving the standard so they will be accepted. It's not true love. But in the spirit, we give because we've been loved. And so we love. Our love's genuine. We give because we know people in need and we want to help them. We're not getting anything from it. We're given because we've already received. As a church, we try to do that. In our giving to outside causes, we have a principle as a leadership team that we only give where we have a personal connection. Um, one organisation we've been given to recently is a Christian orphanage in Zimbabwe. So as you've given into the church, some of your money has gone to that orphanage and we give there because we know they have great need and we know their leadership team and we've heard 
the individual stories and we pray for them. And actually, we're hoping in June of this year that we'll have the lady who directs that orphanage in Zimbabwe coming over to speak at our gathering uh, because we want your heart uh, to be able to be invested as well. It's really important that you hear those stories and you hear about where the money is going. So personal connection is important to love truly. And whilst that's really a heart matter, I also want to say that our hope and our prayer is that as we've moved into a season as a church of more localised gatherings, we're praying and hoping that our relationships with one another will be stronger, will be deeper. We'll know each other more personally. And so we'll be able to recognise need in one another more readily. And we'll be able to love more truly in the Holy Spirit. I know for a fact that it was the case when we used to meet at Excelsior, that even though we only had between 50 and 70 people in our church, which is a small number really, there were individuals who'd both been in that church for over five years who'd never once spoken to one another. That really grieved my heart, and I believe it grieves the heart of God. Now to me, that's first and foremost a heart issue. There's something really wrong with that. But hopefully, as we go smaller, our love will be able to grow bigger for one another. And we can really be able to begin to build closer relationships with each other and sow into one another's lives. Remember that Jesus made a point about caring for the individual. The parable of the lost sheep, the, the parable of the lost coin, and the practice of his life was loving the one, and it was loving them well. Sometimes we feel that by sowing into the lives of just a few people, we're missing out on doing bigger things for God. Because when you sow into people's lives, it takes time. And it takes time away from being able to do the bigger, seemingly more extravagant things. I really don't believe that's how God sees it. I think it's true that we're not called to try and do great things, but to do smaller things with great love. And God will take that offering and he will do what he does best. He'll grow it. What looks weak and what looks small will become great because that's how his kingdom works. We don't need to try and do big, great things. We need to do whatever he's put in front of us with great love. And then he multiplies it. Remember the loaves and the fishes. He, he multiplied it. They only had a, a few things and God took it. Jesus took it and he multiplied it. Remember the smallest seed in the garden became the biggest tree. And it, it stretched out and the birds came and nested in it. Remember how the yeast works through the dough and the bread rose. So let's commit ourselves to be a people who take time to love one another well. That we love sacrificially, that we love generously, that we love personally, that we love in the spirit. And let's pray that as we do, and as we take time to do that, uh, the kingdom will be extended and the world will truly see the love of Jesus among us. Uh, would you pray with me this morning? Father, we thank you for this call to love one another. Thank you that you empower us to love truly because you've truly loved us. We pray that our love will be true. We pray that our love would be selfless. We pray that our love would show itself, not through our words, not through our talk about how well we love people, but through our deeds, that it would be seen by you and by the world as being true, as being real, as being authentic, that you would be manifest. The God who is love will be manifest among us. Lord, as, as we go smaller as a church, that we can know one another better and we can love in the way you've called us to. We can love one another in our house churches and we can love our neighbours around us. Lord, would your kingdom grow? 
would the seed be scattered and lord would uh, great trees grow up would would lord your name be lifted up would you be seen lord jesus would we embrace what looks weak and looks small in order that you might have the glory that you might be seen among us would you enable us to lay ourselves down would you enable us to think about others to care for others to be sympathetic towards others as you are a sympathetic high priest to have compassion towards others and to give we pray lord that we would have all things in common not because we're under a law not because we have a model but because your love is with us and your spirit is present we ask that in jesus name amen god bless you